Intelligibility is something that we think about in the context of how that loudspeaker interacts with the room. Intelligibility is a measure of our ability to understand the spoken word. And of course, those of you who were here yesterday, I did a, a seminar on intelligibility and you've heard this. Here's what I mean by intelligibility. Here's something that's audible. This is a test. This is only a test. Here's something that's intelligible. This is a test. This is only a test. So you can hear both of those, but only one of them was intelligible. And in the past few decades, or the past decade or so, uh, we've come up with a way of, of sort of measuring and predicting intelligibility, and it's called STIPA. And STIPA stands for Speech Transmission Index PA. Okay? So it's a, it's a method um, that can be used, an objective method, to measure something which is subjective. So it's kind of odd in that sense. And it's not 100% accurate, and it's not 100% precise. So by that I mean if you take a stip of measurement standing in one place and don't move, you take that measurement three times, you're going to get three different answers. They're going to be close, but they might be a few points apart. Okay? That's what the stip of sound test sounds like, and, and if I had a stip meter which I do, but I'm not going to take the time, I could walk around and show you the results. But basically the way it's done is that signal is played, and then you can buy apps that work on your iPhone, for example, that can measure that sound or, or detect that sound and give you a reading for it. It requires a little bit of training, but it's not very complicated. Uh, not very complicated. It's easy to do. And the scale is from zero to one, so zero would be completely unintelligible and one would be perfect. Uh, you're never going to see a zero <laughs> and you're never going to see a one. Um, but there's a scale that goes generally from down in the point threes to up in the point sevens or higher. And I'm just going to play a few of these for you so you get a sense of what this means. So, you know, if you um, have the misfortune of having to deal with a, like a point four, Technology is the science and art of making and using things. Human beings are uniquely able to turn the materials of the natural... Not terribly intelligible. By the time you get up into the mid point fives, let's listen to a point five eight. Technology is the science and art of making and using things. Human beings are uniquely able to turn the material... Not great, but still much more understandable. Would you agree? And then finally, up at the top of the scale, Technology is the science and art of making and using things. Right, it's completely intelligible. Human beings are uniquely able. All right, so that's the stippa scale. And as we're going to see a little bit later on, that should be part of your expectation when purchasing a sound system. And we're going to come back to that. Let's talk a little bit about specifications. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit weird, and you're going to bear with me because this is going to seem out of nowhere. But I, I believe it, it, it kind of makes sense if you follow my logic through it. Specifications fit into which of these categories? Right, objective. Yep. And the objective, what I would call domain, okay, or the, the objective blob here on the screen is that collection of things which we can measure. These are things that we have measurement tools for. So what are some of the things we measure in our lives? Well, we measure distance. How far do we travel? We measure time. We measure the weight of things. Um, yeah. Bunch of stuff we measure. We use measurements a lot. But what I find curious is that it seems as though the measurement devices and schemes and approaches that we've developed as human beings rarely correlate to our experience of the universe. Right? Our measurements seem to be, tend to be very linear. One, two, three, four, so forth. Our experience isn't that way. 
For example, we turn off all the lights, it's completely dark, I light one candle, everybody can see, oh, there's a candle. I light two candles, it doesn't get twice as bright. In fact, if you say, well, did that get brighter? People say, I, I, I'm not sure, maybe, but not really. But it's two candles. It's twice as many. So I light two more, now I have four candles. Well, that clearly must be twice as bright. Eh, no, I'm not sure. I don't think so. As it turns out, you have to have a lot of candles before people go, oh, that's twice as bright as it was when you had one. There's a very complex relationship there. And the same is true with audio. If I put up one speaker and I measure it and it's putting out 90 decibels or whatever, and then I put up a second speaker and you're going to go, oh my God, it's going to put 180 out there. Eey. No. A, it doesn't put 180. And B, most people would say, I think I hear a difference, but I'm not sure. Well, how does that work? Two is twice one. As it turns out, I'd probably have to put 10 of those speakers all playing 90, assume they all couple, which is a big assumption, before people will go, oh yeah. Or another way to think of that exercise, if, you're, if you hand somebody a box with a, with a fader on it and, and you connect it to a speaker and so forth, you say, okay, here's a level, and you put it at some level on that fader, and you say, adjust the fader until it sounds twice as loud. The average person off the street, I'm not talking about a trained sound person, would push that fader to 10. Yeah, 10, if it starts at 1, it would have to go to 10 before people say, oh yeah, it's twice as loud. So we would, um, we would love to believe that the mapping, right, that the transition between these two was simple. We'd love to believe that we could measure something, for example, with a spec sheet, <laughs> and that that would predict a subjective outcome. We'd love it if that were true. Here's a measurement. On the basis of this measurement, you're going to love this speaker. Really? How would that work? I mean, we wish it were true, but it's a fantasy. So, you know, just to sort of emphasize this a little bit more, um, if we use the word hot, for example. Well, hot is a, is a wonderfully ambiguous word in English. It has many, many, many different meanings. Yeah. It could mean temperature. It could mean spice. When you say, this is a hot car, it could mean that's a really cool car. Interesting choice of words, the hot car is cool. It could mean the car was stolen. Hot could be a hot topic, which means let's not go there. Yeah. So let's take one example. Let's take hot in terms of spice. Now, as it turns out, there is an objective measurement of spice in food. It's called the Scoville scale. And the Scoville scale measures the amount of capsaicin in peppers. Now the Scoville scale goes from zero, which meaning there's nothing there, to I believe it's over three million. It's a pretty big scale. So imagine that you're preparing a meal and you decide to use some peppers that are measured on the Scoville scale of about 10,000. Okay. Is that hot? Perfect answer. It depends, right? Depends on what? Well, it depends on a lot of things. But to some degree, it depends on who your guests are. And meaning no offense to people who grew up in Kansas, if your guests are from Kansas and the spiciest food they've ever eaten was a potato, a Scoville of 10,000 is going to drive them screaming from the room. If, on the other hand, your guests were all born in India, and you serve them a dish of a Scoville uh, level of 10,000, 
they're going to politely say, thank you very much, but this is really bland food. <laughs> I can hardly taste it. Yeah. So I suggest to you that the word hot, in terms of spice, means nothing. Or rather, that the objective Scoville score means nothing. Or maybe they both mean something, but the problem is you can't link one to the other. The only way I could accurately predict if my guests are going to find this hot would require a whole lot more objective data. Where do they come from? What are they used to eating? What is their tolerance? What's their metabolism at any given moment? I'd have to get a lot of objective data to map into the subjective before I could make the assessment, yep, this is hot, or this is not. And so, you know, the mapping might look something like this, or worse. Let's think of something in our own business, pitch. Now, pitch is something that we hear in our brains. Pitch is not frequency. We've been taught that maybe it is, but it isn't. And I can prove it to you. Pitch is actually a sensation that's based on many different objective elements. It's based on frequency, yes. But it's also based on sound pressure level. It's based on duration. It's based on spectrum. It's based on a bunch of stuff that we don't even understand yet. But it is not frequency. And if you don't believe it, Go home and take, uh, you know, go on the internet if you don't have a uh, other way to do it, and play a 350 hertz tone, and play it very quietly. Through, you can even do it through headphones, although it might hurt, but do it through a little speaker, and then take the volume and just crank it up quickly, from quiet to medium loud, and most people will hear the sound go flat. The pitch will change. You didn't change frequency, you changed amplitude. But your brain said, ah, oh, the pitch went flat. Now, for a, a small minority of people, the pitch will go sharp. But for most people, you hear it go flat. But virtually everyone will hear it change. If you repeat that experiment at 2 kilohertz, a higher frequency, and you make it go louder, the majority of people will hear it go sharp. The minority of people will hear it go flat. But again, most people hear it change. So pitch is not frequency. It's related to it, but it isn't it. So once again, the mapping is extremely complex. And of course, loud is the same thing. We associate loud with sound pressure, but it isn't sound pressure. That's one component. I could play you two sounds that have exactly the same sound pressure level. One would make you go, yeah, okay. The other would make you go screaming from the room with your hands over your ears, and lawsuits would be filed that I'm hurting your ears. And the only difference is that one would be 80 hertz and the other would be 3.2 kilohertz, which is the resonance of your ear canal. <laughs> and it's the point that you're most sensitive to, and it really hurts even at 80 or 90 dB. So loud is another one of these very complex things. So I think we can agree, and I probably overstated it, that the, <laughs> that the mapping between objective and subjective is fuzzy. It isn't clear. It isn't as nice as we wish it were. But of course, I wouldn't have left that blank space in the screen if there weren't a third. And there's a third domain that's also important to think about in terms of our experience of audio. It's the semantic domain. This is a collection of words that we use to describe stuff. And of course, you know, if we come back to our hot, if you just think of the word hot by itself, it has no meaning. Or maybe I should say it has 10 meanings that I can think of. And without knowing more, if I just said hot, you have no way of knowing what I'm talking about. I'm giving you no context. I'm giving you no other linguistic cues, social cues, physical cues that give you any way of figuring out what that word means. Right? So the problem is this. You're doing a mix at a church, in a recording studio, it doesn't matter. And somebody in charge comes up and says, you know, that guitar sounds odd. You go, really? Yeah. Yeah. It might not be quite, well, it sounds a little too wooly. Wooly. Yeah, you know, fuzzy fuzzy. Yeah, I mean, 
it kind of like, um, well, maybe like velour. Huh? And you look down at your console, maybe it's a fancy digital console, and you search through the menus, velour, velour, velour. I don't know how to fix a guitar that sounds too much velour. Well, you see, the problem is that the words that were used, fuzzy or, you know, whatever, occur here. And they're referring to some sensation here. But you can't fix anything here. As an acoustician, I used to be called out to fix the rooms. Well, what's wrong with your room? I don't know, it sucks. Really? Great. Let me go to my truck. I have a can of suck be gone. I'm going to come and spray it on your walls, and everything will be fine. I wish. First thing I have to do is figure out what that word means, but then I've got to jump over here to the objective domain and fix it. And I submit that that's what we all do all the time when we're working with audio, right? Okay, so why do I talk about this? It's coming back to specifications. Specifications don't tell you anything, except for what was measured. They do not. They do not. They cannot tell you that you're going to like the speaker. And yet they are important. Okay? And I, I beg you, <laughs> if you're in the situation of having to buy sound systems, and I'm not going to do it with you this morning, go through each of these things and figure out what they mean. It is knowable. And you owe it to yourselves and to your congregation to do that due diligence to learn this stuff. There's good books out there, like the Audio Encyclopedia. That's a reference book. Yeah. It's expensive. But if you're an audio professional, you should probably have one on the shelf. Disclaimer, I wrote a few chapters in it. That's not why I'm plugging it. It's a good reference book. Understand what the squiggles mean. The squiggles don't say the sound's going to be great. The squiggles don't say the sound's going to be spicy or hot or cold or cool or warm or sizzly or funky. They say it's going to be plus or minus x dB from x to y hertz. Which doesn't mean nothing, but it doesn't mean anything more than that. But the key thing to look for is the labels. If you see one of these graphs with squiggles and there's no numbers here, go away, leave, quickly, because it means absolutely nothing. 